Good morning. Welcome again to the Bethany Associate Reform Presbyterian Church as we come together today to worship the Lord our God and give thanks for the blessed resurrection of Jesus Christ. So as we begin today, just a few announcements. Uh, first of all, tonight at 5 o'clock, we'll have the ice cream uh, social for the music conference kids, and they'll be uh, presenting a little bit of uh, some of the music they learned at music conference this summer. Again, that'll be at 5 o'clock. And just as a reminder for music conference kids, uh, please be here by 4.15 so that y'all can do a little bit of practicing uh, beforehand. So again, the uh, uh, ice cream social itself will be at 5, and then kids, please be here at 4.15. Also, uh, the high school retreat uh, for Catawba Presbytery along with First, Second, and Grace Presbyteries will be September 24th through 26th. And more information about that will be upcoming the sign-up date is going to be the 10th of uh, September. So again, if you have any questions about the high school retreat, please see uh, Miss Brandy Glasser. Also, uh, as part of the announcements, uh, please take a look at the information of the Bone Clark and Weekend that's in your bulletin. Just as a reminder, uh, next Lord's Day, we'll be having worship up at Bone Clark and, uh, in Flat Rock, and if you're unable for whatever reason to join us up there, we do invite y'all to attend that Clover ARP uh, next Lord's Day. But we do in invite everyone to come up, uh, not just for Sunday morning worship, but for the weekend. And if you have any questions about that, please see uh, Mr. Ronnie or Miss Kim Smith. Now, Miss Kim did give me uh, several announcements to read as far as Mount Clark and uh, weekend next weekend. Uh, there are sign-up sheets at the back uh, for uh, meals. Uh, so please take a look at that. Uh, if you're eating any or Saturday, please see the food list and sign up. Uh, also, Friday night, uh, we're going to Bay Breeze for supper in Hendersonville. It's a fish camp. If you plan on going, please let Ronnie Smith know. Uh, also, uh, that group will meet at 530 at the hotel at Bon Clarkin. Also, as, uh, just as an FYI, uh, there is a sinkhole at exit 54 off I-26, which is causing some uh, traffic problems up that way. So just kind of keep that in mind as you leave uh, to go up there that it might be uh, a little bit more uh, than uh, normal. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Also, uh, the last thing I have uh, written down here, just uh, we uh, restarted our Wednesday night uh, prayer meeting and Bible study and youth groups uh, this past week. And so I invite you to join with us this Wednesday at 630 uh, for that. If you have any questions on that, uh, just see uh, me after worship or send a note. And as we begin to worship today, let us do so as we prepare ourselves through prayer. Amen. Our call to worship today comes to us from the 134th Psalm, uh, verses 1 through 3. So let us begin our worship today with the word that God has given to us by his grace. Again, Psalm 134, and verse 1. Behold, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who by night stand in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. The Lord who made heaven and earth bless you from Zion. Amen. As we hear this call to worship, this reminder of the blessings that we have in our God, we return thanks unto the Lord as we begin worship today by singing uh, from our green uh, Bible song book, uh, Bible song number 253. Again, as we stand, let us sing with joy in our hearts and thanksgiving. Again, we'll be singing 253. Let us stand and rejoice together.
we hear in this wonderful rendition of Psalm 119. Thy laws have been our comfort and our peace. They remind us of the glory of our God and of his grace and of his mercy. Let us come now before the Lord our God once more in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, you have given unto us this beautiful Lord's Day. This day where we set aside all of our earthly labors. and We look unto the kingdom that is made without hands. That glorious blessing that you have promised to us. For dear God, we testify that we live not in the wilderness journey. But we rest in the promised land flowing with milk and honey. Because we are united by faith to our Savior Jesus Christ. Who is our peace and our comfort both this day and forevermore. Dear God, we pray in the power of your Holy Spirit that you, dear God, will give us again a testimony in our hearts and in our soul and in our flesh that you are our God and that we are your people and that we might go forth in this house of worship today remind you of the glory that is the blessing of being a son and daughter of the living God. And now we come together to say the words your son taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's turn now in our copies of God's Word to the uh, 16th chapter of the book of Luke as we continue to look at this portion of God's Word. And can we turn there to chapter 16, verses 1 through 13, as we hear the parable of the unjust story. You can hear the word of the Lord from Luke 16, verse 1. He also said to his disciples, There was a certain rich man who had a store, and an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. So he called him and said to him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your swordship, for you can no longer be stored. And the steward said within himself, What shall I do for my master is taking the stewardship away from me? I cannot dig. I am ashamed to beg. I have resolved what to do. But when I am put out of the stewardship, that they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of his master's debtors to him and said to the first, How much do you owe my master? And he said, A hundred measures of oil. So he said to him, Take your bill and sit down quickly and write fifty said to another, And how much do you owe? So he said, A hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill and write eighty. So the master commanded the unjust store, because he had dealt shrewdly. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. And I say to you, Make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail they may receive you into an everlasting home. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much, and he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? No servant can serve two masters. For either you will hate the one and love the other, or else you will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Amen. Please be seated. I invite children to come up and lesson today. Good morning. How's everybody doing today? Good. You're good. Good. Now, how was y'all's first week of school? My week is next week. Ah, okay. <laughs> Mine is this week. 
Well, how's everybody? That's yes, right. I know a couple of y'all start next week, but how was this first week for the rest of you? It was good. Y'all, y'all happy to be back in school? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I have a feeling that a lot of the teachers kind of are at the same, <laughs> same wavelength right now. But, you know, one of the things we talked about last week is, you know, that the school year is supposed to be 180 days of instruction, right? And you go all the way through May, and some of y'all go through June. Now, that seems like a long time, doesn't it? Yeah. (laughs) Well, one of the things we talked about last week is that, are you going to go through that whole 180 days by yourself? No. No, right? Who's going to go through all that time with you? Your friends. Your friends? Who else? Your mom, right? Because she's your teacher, right? Who, you know, who else is going to be with you? God. God's going to be with you, right? Now, if God's going to be with you through that whole 180 days, how long do you think God's going to be with you next summer? Does he, does he take a break when school's out? No. no. No, right? He is with you not just during school, but after school and before school and while you're asleep, and over the summer, and all those kind of things. Now, one of the things we're going to talk about in the sermon today is that God made the sun and the moon. And he made the light, and he made the darkness. And one of the things about all that that gives us comfort is that even in the good times, the Lord is with us. And the Lord is with us in the bad times. Now, why do we need the Lord in the good times? You ever wondered why? That's right, because without him, we wouldn't be having good times. And so it's important for us that no matter what's going on in our life, whether we're in school or whether we're on vacation or whether we're looking forward to vacation or we're looking forward to school, whatever it is, it's important for us to remember that we have all of those things because God has provided them for us. And, and what do you think that should do to us? And what should our response be to that? That's right. We should give thanks to the Lord for that, right? We should give thanks to the Lord, not just for the good times, but we also should give thanks to the Lord for the hard times because all of these things are in the Lord's hands. And so we can be comforted and have peace in them because the Lord is with us and the Lord is directing all things for his glory. All right, y'all ready to pray? Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks again that you, uh, dear God, are the God over all things. You're the God over school. You're the God over home. You're the God over the beach. You're God over everything. Dear God, this is a great and wonderful comfort to us because we know that you love us through your Son, Jesus Christ, and you have shown us that love each and every day. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Part of the beauty, again, of being a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and understanding that He is our God is something that we're getting ready to sing about in Bible song number 29. That God is our keeper. He is the one who has made the pathways for us as we walk in this life. So let us stand and rejoice in this truth and in this goodness as we sing together uh, Bible song number 29. Let us stand, let us rejoice and give thanks.
us come and be seated as we return unto the Lord and bring the needs of our hearts and our lives and of the goodness of his grace unto him. So let us come and let us pray. The God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God of glory and the God of truth, the God of wisdom and understanding, the God who has granted unto us the knowledge of salvation, the God who has awoken us out of death and unto life, who has shown us the light of his marvelous grace. Unto you we gather together this morning, dear God, to lift up our hearts and our minds and our souls to you. Dear God, we take a great pleasure and great joy and great peace from the knowledge that your Holy Spirit has searched out the depths of our hearts. Dear God, you know us. You know our troubles. You know our weaknesses. You know our every thought. And dear God, while we do confess our iniquities before you, and we do, dear God, confess our sins, dear God, we are amazed, dear God, that after looking into that darkness, dear God, you have not cast us away. Dear God, you have provided through the life, death, and resurrection of your only begotten Son, those sins would be forgiven, that those sins would be washed away in his blood. Dear God, we ask this morning as we do think upon our own life, as we think upon our own waywardness, that we would not be as those without hope, but as those who know the peace the forgiveness of sins, who know what it means to have the weight of that brought off our shoulders and placed on the shoulders of Christ. For dear God, he is our comfort. He is our strength. He is our rock and our foundation, our strong tower. Dear God, we pray this morning that you, through the power of your Holy Spirit, will help us to see that more clearly. Dear God, as we do recognize uh, the ways in which we fall short, that our eyes will not stay upon uh, those things, but would look up onto the cross, onto Golgotha itself, and that our eyes then would turn to the empty tomb, where we are reminded that you have accepted the sacrifice of your Son. That you, dear God, have cleansed us from all unrighteousness. That you, dear God, have given unto us new life. You have borne us again. You have borne us from above. And we are no longer that one who is dead in sin. We are now alive. New creatures. And dear God, our place is in the heavens above. Where our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has gone before to prepare for us mansions in which to dwell forever. Dear God, as we do meditate and think upon these glories today, dear God, we do pray that you will give us hearts of joy and of thanksgiving. That you will give us hearts which desire to know you more. Hearts which desire to be fed by your word. To seek you in the days of trouble as much as in the days of plenty. That we, dear God, would seek the opportunities that you give unto us to lift up our hearts unto you. We pray, dear God, that you would prepare us uh, for moments of private devotion, for family devotion, for corporate worship, and Bible study, and all of these things. 
Dear God, we recognize that we are not alone in this walk. And that, dear God, you have provided for us brothers and sisters. You have provided for us a house. You have provided for us this family born by grace by which we can bear one another's burdens and rejoice with one another. Dear God, we pray this morning for this body of Christ. We pray, dear God, for the Bethany Church. As we do ask forgiveness of our sins as a church, dear God, we do ask that you will focus our hearts and our minds upon you, that everything that we do might be done for your glory. And we do pray again for the trials that are ongoing. We pray for those who are backsliding, dear God, we pray that you will lift them up. Dear God, we pray that you would give us the word seasoned with grace to warn them of the path that they are on. And dear God, we trust in the promises that you have made to those who have received your sign. We pray, dear God, that we would not be discouraged in this work, but that we would trust again in you. We pray also, dear God, for those who are mourning this morning. We pray, dear God, that you would give them hope, give them peace and comfort, Pray, dear God, that your hand be upon, especially today, uh, the Davis and Marquis families. We pray, dear God, earnestly for the work of your Holy Spirit, that you might again provide for them a light to shine in the darkness. And again, we do continue to pray in your mercy for those who are ill and those who are in hospital and those who are dealing with long-term illness, dear God. Pray, dear God, that you would bring healing unto their bodies, that you would bring strength unto their spirits, and that you would give them, again, all that they need at this time. For gracious God Almighty, our hope in the midst of these difficult times is not in the works of the flesh, but in the works of the Spirit. Dear God, you have given unto us the weapons of the Spirit. You have given unto us prayer. You've given unto us uh, fellowship with one another. And dear God, we pray that again, as we make use of these gifts uh, for the blessings of the body, that dear God, you will give us your strength to persevere in them. Dear God, again, we think upon the needs of the Bethany Church. Dear God, we do lift up unto you the needs of all of our brothers and sisters, wherever they might be gathered today. Dear God, it is our practice to pray for the churches here in your county, and we do so again this morning. We pray, dear God, for every pulpit in this community, that as they preach Christ and Him crucified, that your work will be done that men and women might come under the conviction of sin, that they might see their need for Christ, and that you might provide for them. We also, dear God, remember our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan today. Dear God, the, the, the trial that they are ongoing at the moment is uh, almost without uh, words to express. Dear God, we know that you are with them. We know, dear God, that even if they are martyred and have been martyred, that, dear God, you are their God. And their deaths are witnesses to your promise and your truth. That you will never forsake nor forget your people. Dear God, we do pray uh, for their persecutors. We pray, dear God, for those who are leading destruction. Dear God, we pray uh, that you would open their hearts. Dear God, that you would show them their own need for Christ. Dear God, we pray that in persecution we might see revival. We might see these wicked men no longer be wicked but be righteous. Dear God, if it would be your will that you would bring judgment down upon that land, dear God, we pray that it would be swift and true. Dear God, we do ask that these things because you are the God of justice and the God of over your people. And you have given warning to the nations that if they strike your people, then they will receive the rod. Dear God, we pray in your 
and in your mercy, dear God, that you would show mercy. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we continue to worship you this morning, and as we go from this place today, dear God, we pray that you would go with us. That, dear God, we would uh, wake up tomorrow morning ready to serve you, ready to do that which you have called us to do, no matter where we are in life. That we, dear God, would serve you as husbands and as wives, as children, as brothers, as sisters, as fathers and mothers, as aunts and uncles. Dear God, we pray for these labors that you've given to us. For dear God, you have made us to declare your glory, to show forth praise unto men. May we do this in all that we do for Christ's sake and for his gospel. And in his name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand for the reading of God's word as we turn once more to the first chapter of the book of Genesis. As we uh, turn now to uh, uh, some other creation days as we continue in this study. Again, Genesis chapter 1. Again, let us stand for the reading of God's word. Hear the word of the Lord in Genesis 1 verse 6. Then God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. So the evening and the morning were the second day. Then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the third day. Then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be signs and seasons for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light and the darkness. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Then God said that the waters abound with abundance of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth, across the face of the firmament of the heavens. So God created great sea creatures, and every living thing that moves, with which the waters abounded, according to their kind, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. So the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth, each according to its kind. It was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Man, let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, as you've given us these words on this day by your providence, we ask, dear God, that you would apply these words under our heart and give us uh, more light and understanding. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. One of the questions that I'm sure comes up as we read this uh, telling of the creation from the second day uh, to uh, this uh, fifth day is the testimony of what exactly the Lord is on about. What is he doing in this creation? Now we know, of course, that all things can be created for the glory of God. But we need to kind of think more deeply about this. What exactly is God doing? 
Well, one of the first things that God is doing is he's showing us something about the nature of how he works. We do not serve a God who starts something without finishing it. If you notice, as God is creating, as he's speaking these things into existence, he's not just taking kind of a box full of seeds and casting them about and letting them be. But, there, but God has designed each one of the fruits, each one of the animals, each one of the fish of the sea to serve a specific purpose in his kingdom. And he's not only done that, but he has grown them himself. God has established the apple tree to make apples. And God, again, has ensured that the apple tree produces apples. He has not left the tree to kind of do what it wants to do. Again, he has designed it, he has created it, and he has completed it. And as believers of the Lord Jesus Christ... This is something that we are to understand about our own salvation, our own redemption purchased by Christ. That God has not just made us and left us. That God has not just wiped the slate clean and then put us off to our own ways. But God has designed our steps. And as we sang in the psalm, God is leading us on the path to the heavens themselves. The same God who is going to breathe life into us in the passage that follows is the same God who by his providence will bring us to the end and will ensure that we are found to be sheep on the day of judgment. That's one of the first things that we can learn from the creation that we see here. That our God, who has made the heavens and the earth, who has made the seas and the dry land, who has divided the firmament, and I'll explain exactly what the firmament is here in a second, but this same God who has made each of these things in their kind, for their kind, has made sure that when the apple fruits, that it is good fruit. And that fruit is made to be eaten. It's made to be enjoyed. It's made to bring glory, not just to the apple tree, but to all the animals who will benefit from the apple tree. We see something similar here with the animals and the command that's given to them. We see here that the Lord God has made the cattle and the creeping things of the earth. And what command does he give them in this portion in verse 22? It says that God blessed them. He calls them to be fruitful and multiply. Think about that for a moment. Who is the first being to get a blessing in the Bible? It's not Adam, it's not Eve, it's not us. The first creature to get a blessing in the Bible are these great sea creatures and everything that lives and moves in the sea and in the air. So the next time you're out fishing and you see the abundance of the seas, one of the things you need to remember in that is that it's God who has given that blessing. It's God who has enabled those animals to be there and has provided for them everything that they need. And we see this in one of the great miracles of the Lord Jesus Christ at the end of his ministry in the last chapter of the book of John. You remember there as Jesus appears uh, to them and as they're speaking what has Peter and some of the others done? They've gone out into the boat and they have thrown the net and what have they done? They haven't caught anything, have they? But what happens when the Lord Jesus tells them to throw the net on the other side? Well, they throw it on the other side and the nets are so full they can't bring it into the boat. They 
kind of have to hold it while they bring it into the land. And one of the purposes of that witness unto the disciples is another reminder that they are not to rest and trust in their own wisdom and own understanding, but are to be reminded that the Lord God is going to provide for them and can provide for them abundantly. And that's something else, again, we're meant to see here in the creation, is that not only does every part of the creation have a purpose, and not only is God designing that purpose, and not only is he putting that purpose into action and completing it, but God is blessing every part of his creation. And each part of the creation then, again, is given so that the rest, of creation can benefit from it. And what's the purpose of the creation of the seeds? It's so that the fish have somewhere to live. If God had just created dry land, what would happen to all the fish? Well, if you've ever you know, heard, you know, heard or seen what's happened to the Aral Sea in Central Asia, you know, what happens when the water disappears is that all the fish die. Because what can't fish do? Right? They have gills, right? So they cannot live in air, right? They need water to survive. Likewise, if God had just made the seas, where would the cattle go? Now, I know cattle like to get in the water and mess things up and make all kinds of things. But what happens if you toss a bunch of cattle in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean? Right? They might swim for a little bit, but are they going to be able to swim all the way to North Carolina or Spain? No, right? They're going to die because they're not fish. They're not made to live in the water. And so God made the dry land so that the cattle would have somewhere to live. But he also has made the grass of the field so that the cattle have something to eat. So we see again how... Everything in creation is made for its purpose and designed by the Lord to bless the other parts of the creation. Again, what's this meant to teach us as believers? Again, when we look out unto the sun and the stars and we look out unto the cattle and the creeping things and the fish of the sea and all of these things, we are meant to rejoice in the blessings that the Lord has provided for us. That every part of creation is a testimony to the glory of God, to the goodness of God, and to the way that our God is wise above all things. That how everything works together for a purpose. Now what's the reality again of the world in which we live today? The world in which we live today is focused upon overturning God's good order, of denying that the Lord has a purpose for all things and that we as the cre creation can decide what kind and kind and kind is. And so what happens when we mix things that are not supposed to go together? Trouble happens. And what's the problem with fallen man? When trouble happens, who do they blame? They blame the Lord, don't they? You know, how often when you stub your toe in the middle of the night, do you blame the Lord? Well, whose fault is it? Well, maybe you shouldn't leave things laying on the floor in the middle of the night. Maybe you should turn the light on so you can see it's not the Lord's fault that you stubbed your toe. It's yours. But why? why? Why do we blame the Lord? Because again, we like to believe that we are in charge of all things and we are wise in our own eyes. That's something we talked about in Sabbath school this morning as we looked at Proverbs 26. One of the ways you can tell a fool is that a fool returns to his vomit. Just like a dog. One way you can tell a fool is that they believe that it can snow in the summertime. 
Now, again, I'm sure there's places where it snows in the summertime, but does it snow in Clover, South Carolina in the middle of July? No. Would you like it to snow in the, in the middle of July? You might want to, but what would that do to the creation? What would that do to the world if all of a sudden it started snowing in the middle of July in South Carolina? Do you think that would cause problems? I mean, it's bad enough when it snows in the middle of December in South Carolina. But if it started snowing in the middle of July in South Carolina, what would that do to the crops? What would that do to the animals? What would that do to everything that's built upon it being warm in the summertime? Would it not, again, bring total chaos to things? But how does the world operate in its own mind? Right? The world operates as if it should snow in South Carolina in July, and we're going to do everything we can to make it so. And can they do that? Well, of course, the answer is no, but that doesn't stop them from trying, which is why, again, the scriptures use the word fool to describe those who deny reality, who deny that God Almighty alone has the power to design and say what purpose things are for. Now, another thing we see in the midst of this opening chapter of the book of Genesis is we also are told something about how God makes us aware of these truths. Right? The creation testifies to the glory of God. Right? Psalm 19 tells us that. We're also told something about the nature of the very word that God has given to us in the scriptures by what we see in Genesis chapter 1. In Exodus chapter 20, as we're receiving the Ten Commandments, what does Moses receive from the Lord? In verse 11. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. And one of the things that tells us again is that not only has God created all things, but God has designed all things, God has ordered all things for the blessing of man, and also he has revealed this to us in the law. And he's revealed this to us in the very word that he wrote with his own finger, that we might not only show glory unto him, but that we might live in accordance with his declared will in the scriptures. And so when we hear it say in verse 6, then God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the earth. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament and it was so. Again, when the Lord speaks, the Lord does and the Lord completes. So, for instance, when we hear at the beginning of the book of Hebrews, when the Apostle Paul writes and says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. He had, he had by himself purged our sins and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. When we hear those words from Hebrews chapter 1, we're told that God who spoke all these things into existence, the God who made all things, who designed all things, who has made it so was not alone in that work, right? We believe that the triune God was involved in the creation of the heavens and the earth. And what we see there in Hebrews 1 is that when God speaks, it happens, but we're also told that when Jesus Christ speaks, it happens. So in the creation of the world, we have a testimony to the authority of the Word of God. Right? We believe that the scriptures that we have in the Old and New Testaments, from Genesis to Revelation, is the very Word of the God who made the heavens and the earth. 
And the power that we have in the Word of God is the same as the power that we see exhibited to us in the mountains and in the oceans and in the birds and in the animals and in all of creation. So when we hear a promise, for instance, in the Word of God, why can we trust it? Well, look out and see the creation around you. Right? The promise that God has made to you in Jesus Christ is as real as the wood on the pole. If you can grab and touch this wood, then you can grab and touch the promises God has made. It's one of the reasons why we hear in Hebrews chapter 11 that definition of faith. What is faith in Hebrews chapter 11? Is it not the sure thing? Is it not the thing that we can grasp and take hold of? Again, creation testifies to us that this is true. It's fascinating how many times in the Old and New Testaments, the writers and the prophets and the, uh, the teachers of God's Word point back to the creation to help us understand this. In Psalm 136, 9, David writes, The moon and the stars to rule by night, for his mercy endures forever. So again, what does the moon and the stars teach us? To trust in the mercy of the Lord. Especially in a day and age where there were no electric lights and there was a very limited knowledge about what was surrounding you at night, what enabled you to close your eyes as you lay in a tent in the middle of the desert. It was the fact that you knew that the Lord God was merciful. And the sun and the stars witnessed this to you. And that's what we hear of in the creation story this morning. I think the, the, the moon and the stars rule by night. The psalmist there is not saying that there is a God of the night. And there's a God of the day. And you know, as the Roman and Greeks believed. But that the one true and living God had established the moon and the stars to give us a visible representation of this truth. So if you're afraid at night, look up under the sky and see the moon and the stars. For by them they testify to you that his mercy endures forever. When God was making a promise to Abram about the covenant that he was making, what did God tell Abram to do in Genesis 15? He tells him to look up unto the heavens and do what? Count the stars. And what are the stars going to tell Abram? So shall your descendants be. I don't know if you've ever had the blessings and opportunity of being in a place that is not ruined by light pollution and you can actually see at night. And what do you see? You see stars that go from horizon to horizon. Now, have you ever tried to count all of those stars? Well, if you have, then you know that you're not done by the time the sun comes up. And of course, we have the blessing of technology and know that how many stars are out there that we can't see with the naked eye? A lot. Yeah, I'm not going <clears> to <throat> try to figure it out in my brain right now, but there's a lot out there. More than we can even possibly imagine. So imagine if you're Abram and you're hearing the revelation of the Lord, this promise coming down upon you, and he tells you to look in the sky and see the stars. And he says, this is going to be your descendants. Now, if he's trying to do math and figure out, well, if I have this many kids, I'm going to have this many grandkids and this many great-grandkids. You know, well, how long has it been since Abram received this covenant promise? It's been a few years ago, has it? How many descendants has Abram gained since Genesis 15? Quite a bit. But of course, if we understand that God here is not speaking of his fleshly descendants, but of those who will be the heirs to the promises that God has made in the covenant. Well, think about the number of the elect. Think of the number of the, those who have been receivers of the grace of God. It's more than we possibly can imagine. But we can look up in the sky and see and be reminded 
That the God who made the heavens and the earth, the God who put the stars to rule by night, who is by His providence continuing to add to that number day by day. And what should that do to us but cause us to worship and give thanks to the Lord who by His mercy endures forever? Another thing that the psalmist does to help us again see the beauty and the bounty of this is he, in Psalm 147 verse 4, says that God counts the numbers of the stars and he calls them all by name. Think about that for a moment. You know, we, we kind of conceptually can, can, can understand, well, God's big, he's bigger than me, and God's smarter than me, and he knows all these things. But think about that for a moment. Not only does God know how many stars there are, he has them all by name. Now, one of the weird things about living in this age is that there is a sucker born every moment. And one of those things that you can do is you can give your, however much they're charging nowadays for it, but you can uh, call the or online, get on there and send stuff, and you can by a star, right? You can have your name put on a star in the heavens. Now, I don't know how authoritative that, that kind of thing is. I don't know if it's registered with NASA or something like that. But think about that. How, how many people would have to buy into that to get all the stars named? It, innumerable and forever. You know, talk about a good grift. It's something that's a recession proof, right? There's always stars out there to get named. But the Lord God knows each one of them. Not only does he have them named, but what does he know about them? He knows their weight. He knows their size. And what else does he know about every single one of them stars? He knows their purpose. He knows their future. He knows what they have been designed to do. So let's say, for example, that the sun that we see outside right now blows up. Now, what would happen? We'd get vaporized, wouldn't we? Now, do you think the Lord is going to vaporize us by the sun that's nearby us? Well, no, right? God's not going to do that because why? Because in the scriptures, God has told us that's not how things are going to happen. Right? That's not how God has revealed to us the end of the world will take place. It won't be us dying in the heat death of the sun. We know that the scriptures tell us that the Son has been given for our blessing and for the purpose of overseeing us, providing us with light to see during the day. And that when the Lord Jesus comes, one of the things we're also told in the book of Revelation is what's no longer going to be around when the Lord Jesus returns. The sun and the moon will have fulfilled their purpose. One of the things that uh, sometimes gets brought up here in the first chapter of the book of Genesis is that, well, how could the plants grow without the sun? And it seems like it's out of order, right? Because you know, that, that's not how this happens, right? We know that, that about photosynthesis and all that good stuff, right? And I'm not up here trying to deny that photosynthesis is a real thing. But what causes the seeds to grow? What causes the seeds to flourish? Is it not the very hand of the living God? Do they need photosynthesis? Yes. But it's not required, is it? Because it's the Lord who has established the seeds. It's the Lord who has established the plants. And it's the Lord who by the light of himself has caused these things to grow. Right? And that's a testimony to us again about the nature of God's oversight over all things. And that's why when we read, for instance, from Psalm 147, we're told about the way that God knows the uh, stars and knows all these things, that it provides us with comfort. Let's think about what the Lord Jesus Christ says at, towards the end of the Sermon on the Mount. If God knows the stars, and he names the stars, and if God has created the earth and, and guides the life of every animal and every uh, you know, bacterium and everything in the creation, then what do you think God is going to do with you? And if God has taken care of the lily of the valley, 
If God has taken care of the rows of Sharon, if God has taken care that the animals have their food, then God is going to provide what you need. So why should we worry? Why should we be anxious in this world? Why should we be concerned with these things? Well, again, the answer is pretty obvious. We shouldn't. When we think about the nature of God's mercy and the nature of God's love and the nature of God's grace as it's shown to us here in the first chapter of the book of Genesis, it should drive that anxiety out of our mind. Because the Lord who knows the stars knows his people. In fact, what has the Lord God done for us? The Lord God who has made all things and created all things is also the same God who has given us new life in his son. If God has the power to make the mountains, then he has the power to remove the transgressions from our soul. And of course we know that he's done this because that's what he said in his word. And that's why, again, we can trust in our salvation. That's why we can trust in the redemption purchased by Christ because we look out to the created world around us and we see the order of things and we see the nature of things and we see, again, the, 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 the majesty of all things. We know the kind of God that we serve. The prophet Isaiah gives us a witness to this in chapter 46 as he says, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Calling a bird of prey from the east, the man who executes my counsel from a far country. Indeed, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. And if this is true, now remember what the Apostle Paul has told us in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Again, if it's true that God has made the cattle of the field to eat the grain that he made, then if the Lord Jesus Christ has remade you in his image, given you new life in his Son, that he is going to complete that work. But that's why he's made you. To show forth his glory in your salvation. So if you're struggling with assurance this morning. If you're struggling with where you are in the kingdom of God. If you're struggling with your own walk with Christ. Let this be your comfort. But let it also be the push that you need to live in holiness and righteousness. God has made you for a purpose just as he has made the fish of the sea so that you can walk in it. So that you can show forth again the beauty of the order of God. That's why it's so dangerous for us to try to run away from the purpose that God has made us. To try and deny who we are. To try and do as the world is doing now. Denying the very basic realities of life. As if men can become women and women can become men. And it's born out of this whole idea that God doesn't know what he's doing. And that God has made a mistake somehow. For we know again in the creation and see in the creation that God is good. That he is wise and that he has a purpose. And denying that purpose results in destruction. For just as a cattle who thinks he's a fish will drown, so too will any man who attempts to deny the reality of the world receive the same. So brothers and sisters, as we close this morning, and as we think about again the nature of God's creation, again let us look out under the stars of heaven, look out unto the mountains, unto the ocean, unto the creeping things, and the leviathans, and all of the great works of God, and let us be humbled before them. Let us remember to trust in the word that God has said. And let that be our comfort and our peace as we move forward.
He is God. And we are his workmanship. He has made us to dwell forever in the heavenly places with him through the work of his Son. Let this be our rest and our peace, both this day and forevermore. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks again for this day and this time. And dear God, we ask that you would continue again to show us your truth, that we would heed your counsel and that we would trust in your word. For God has said it, God has done it, and God has completed it. For his glory and for our blessing. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us stand as we close our time today in uh, the, uh, the red uh, hymnal uh, with number seven. Let us stand and sing from all that dwells below the sky. need to speak unto me or one of the elders, please uh, take advantage of that either today or during the week. Again, we are here to serve and to uh, uh, answer or help in any way that we can. Let us go again to uh, the benediction today, which comes from 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning there at verse 17. Hear the word of the Lord. You, therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, Beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and forever. Amen.